All right. We're live with Thomas Hamelrick. Um, this uh, podcast is titled part of the Science of Logic series that I've uh, conducted with uh, already Layman Pascal and, and Daniel Garner, who will be teaching in the upcoming Science of Logic course. And this third one with Thomas Hamelrick, who will also be teaching in the Science of Logic course. And each of these conversations is a little window into not only their expertise and their specialization, um, but also a window into the potential ways we might consider and contemplate, reflect on the contemporary relevance of the science of logic. Thomas Hamelrick is a um, probably most well known in our online circles from his interest in Girard. We're going to be switching it up a little bit today, but I'm sure there's connections to Gerard here somewhere. Must He's be. Uh, in, his, in his professional career, an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science and Biology at the University of Copenhagen, uh, specializing in both machine learning and Bayesian statistics. And again, like I, like I said, uh, he'll be teaching uh, in the Science of Logic course starting uh, January, January 16th. And um, in this conversation, specifically titled Brain Sciences and Artificial Intelligence, we're going to be exploring perhaps the unexpected ways in which contemporary theories of the brain in both biology and computer science um, might have some relationship to Hegelian dialectics and logic. Now, the unifying theory of the brain, which is currently being explored in various fields related to neuroscience, machine learning, and so forth, is mostly inspired by a man named Carl Friston. And Carl Friston's idea of a unified theory of the brain is based on a free energy minimization principle. Now, what does that mean? What it means is, is that we're dealing with the brain as a type of self-organizing bounded system and that this self-organizing bounded system is not simply um, a sort of neuroplastic model where we're, we're looking at sort of an organ which is uh, changing in relationship to being influenced from the outside, but also uh, an internally anticipatory structure meaning that based on active inference, based on its own engaged and continual self-processing, uh, is concerned with its own maintenance and its own transformation. Basically, we're shifting from a, an external understanding of the brain to an internal understanding of the brain and the way in which it is, let's say, maintaining its own boundaries, something like this. Now, this has many um, potential implications for the way in which we think about life, the way in which we think about brains, the way in which we think about intelligence. Um, and I want to get into that a little bit with Thomas here today. So welcome uh, onto the podcast, Thomas. You've been here uh, a few times before. We talked about Nietzsche. Um, so maybe just give a little bit of background about what, um, you know, what this topic, how this topic rather relates to your professional career and uh, why you're interested in, in, in these uh, specific ideas. Yeah, okay. Um, good afternoon, Kadel and everybody else. So, um, so I'd like to, to thank you, first of all, for giving me this opportunity to continue my struggle with Hegel, that is understanding Hegel without really reading him. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so, so Friston has this, uh, so Carl Friston, who's at the University College London, he has this, um, this very interesting model of a Bayesian brain. So basically a brain that does some kind of, uh, some kind of Bayesian inference. And what is interesting to me is that, um, so the mathematics are very familiar to me. Um, so this is basically what I use on a, on a, on a daily basis, so a Bayesian variational inference. So the mathematics are, 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 are not so, so challenging for me. Um, but of course, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that are, um, that are, I have a lot of, so I just started basically by, by reading this also because you kind of challenged me uh, uh, with respect to the logic of science. So I've started looking into this specific, um, this specific theory of the brain. And, um, and so what, what I think is, is, is interesting is also to, to, um, to, to have this dialogue between the, the mathematics of the model and then the way that, that people have been thinking about how the, how the brain works um, all the way back to, to Hegel, right? So that's basically what, what this conversation will be about. 
here's so on the one hand we have this mathematical theory of how the, the brain works and on the on the other hand we have hegel and there are people who are making these these who are starting making these connections right so and and what i find interesting is that for me it's actually it's actually an, a nice way to start to start considering what hegel is all about not by reading hegel itself but by actually reading these these more mathematically precise theories and then seeing to what extent this is reflected in a thinker like hegel so that would be my kind of very uh, yeah my my uh, um let's say um what how i would put it today at this point yeah yeah, no, and I really appreciate, you know, the opportunity to have this conversation and the way, you know, you're specifically open to this conversation and, 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 and also just your approach, because one thing that I've stressed in some of my podcasts that I've been doing, you know, that I've done previously, um, include the idea that this science of logic course is not necessarily a, a historicity. Like we just go back and 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 we're just in, interested in what Hegel says just because, you know, he said it in you know the early 19th century or something like that. We want to see the way in which um, paying time and attention to thinking about the foundations of logic can help us think modern problems in. Contemporary sciences, you know, the the brain sciences, neuroscience, uh, machine learning, and so forth. And I think that the link here with your specific work will um, be one of those unique windows into this. Um, so I opened up, um, you know, this podcast by talking about, um, and I'm going to describe it a little bit clearer, hopefully, is describing the difference between an external cognition of the brain and the internal cognition of the brain. And this is a really important, actually, distinction in Hegelian philosophy, which is, um, you know, external cognition would be, you know, you're, you're, you know, we look, we look at the brain and we look at the way in which it's um, neuroplastic, the way in which it changes, the way in which it has a synaptic connections and the way in which those synaptic ch connections change depending on external stimulus, right? Now, the way in which Friston frames the brain is, is different than this external cognition. He's looking at it an internal cognition, basically the inner life of the brain as an active modeling process. Right. So it's it's again, this distinction between external and internal, which has so much on the line in this theory. And, you know, as it relates to your understanding and the way you do work at the university, um, what do you make of this distinction and, and, and how does it change the way you think about life, intelligence and, and, and brains? Yeah. So so maybe we should just start by by. By just describing the, the the big idea here, right? So if and I'm I'm going to be a bit um, a bit more leaning towards machine learning than towards than towards the brain and consciousness and things like that, right? So suppose that you have a, a very complex um, probability distribution, right? So we, we're we're talking here. So this is a very mathematical um, theory, and um, and so this is this is this is formulated in terms of Bayesian statistics, right? So. So what? Um, so suppose that you have a very complicated probability distribution, and it has some 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 variables, and and um, so these variables are 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 unknown. And so in the in the, the model that we are we are talking about right now, so this model of the brain, this is basically the outside world, right? So I have this this is kind of a latent variable. You, you don't really know what is uh, what is out there. So this is a very complicated probability distribution. And what you normally would, would would do is you would you would kind of say like you would like do something called integrating it out. So you would marginalize this external world. So that would mean that you would consider all possibilities of how this this external world is is actually structured. Um, but this unfortunately this is intractable. You cannot do that. So this is computationally intractable. So that, what you do is you then you you have a second model, a second probabilistic model. Um, which is called the variational model. You can also call it the guide, and this this approximates this approximates this 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 part this missing information that you don't have, basically. And what you're then going to do is you're going to to estimate the parameters of this approximating model um, by um, by minimizing 
the difference between this approximating model and 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 uh, and the complex model that you cannot uh, you you cannot compute um, um, precisely. So this is basically this 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 variational principle. And so 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 maybe we should get, kind of keep it very general. And and the thing is that so you have this one probability distribution that is very complex, and you cannot you, you cannot directly work with it. So you're going to work with a, with a, a second probability distribution that is much simpler. And what you are going to do is you're going to minimize the difference between these two distributions. And the, the, the amazing thing that this is actually tractable, right? So in order to, to, um, in order to approximate this, this very complex probability distribution, you have another probability distribution. And what is actually tra tractable is to minimize the difference between these two. Um, so that, that's this, this general principle be, be, be behind the, the variational inference. And what is specifically um, special about, about, um, about the approach of Friston is that it's, it's, it's active inference. And um, so that is, um, yeah. Maybe that maybe we should maybe so I just want to hear what kind of questions you have at this point because it's uh, yes, yeah. it's, it's probably quite complicated. No, and I, I want to make some I want to make some connections here in regards to the language. Um, so when we talk about um, these two models, you know, the complex world that you cannot possibly have all the information for, and this second model, which is more simplistic. Now, this second model, which is more simplistic, which is the brain's basically internal model. To yeah. me, to me, this sounds a lot like the break in German idealism, where Kant introduces the transcendental a priori. The tra in other words, the the big the big thing with the big thing that happens in philosophy, as far as I understand it, with Kant, is that before Kant, you have this idea that you're studying the being outside you know, the great universal being and philosophy is studying the great universal being instead of the reductionist side. But what Kant's saying is, is that this great external being outside, you only ever understand it through these a priori categories internal to your mind. There's an internal structure of the mind, which is interpreting, actively interpreting. So you have the active imagination, you have the mind is actively synthesizing. The synthetic a priori. So this sounds a lot like, you know, um, the difference between, you know, pre-Kantian and post-Kantian philosophy, namely this introduction that we only ever understand the world through certain categories, through a system of logic, which our brain is already working with, so to speak. And so this this difference between the very complex environment and the way our internal model approaches this complex environment, this same dynamic seems to be at work in the brain sciences. What do you make of this? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so again, as I said, I'm just starting to to um, to, to study this um, this theory, right? And um, so I, I don't really know to what extent it's it's located uh, with respect to these ideas. Um, so, so you indeed, so so you have this internal model, right, which which helps you to approximate this 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 big probability distribution. Now, mm -hmm. so one of the questions that I had when I was reading this this article, so one of the articles that we read is called "The Mark of Blankets of Life: Autonomy, Active Inference, and the Free Energy Principle." So you have this this let's say this big probability distribution um, that you want to approximate, right? So. Then the question is, where does this big probability distribution come comes come from? So as far as I understand, so this is the this is the, the the organism itself, which which somehow represents a probability distribution over the external states, um, and so so there is this boundary between the organism itself and the rest of the world, and and this is called a a Markov blanket. So and the Markov blanket is a is a concept that comes from uh, graphical models, so from probabilistic graphical models from Bayesian networks. And this is basically a, a set of random variables that isolates a part of a probabilistic model from the rest of a probabilistic model. So in, in simple words, you can kind of see like you have a cell, right? And you have a cell membrane that isolates the inside of the cell from the outside. And that's in a probabilistic terms, if you represent that as a probabilistic model, that would that boundary, that would be the, the, the mark of blanket. And so, so what, what the cell is constantly doing, it, it is trying to, to update the internal state 
to predict um, to make sense of all the of all the, the the sensory inputs and also to to come up with actions that that would um, that would um, that would make that would minimize the distance between the internal model and the and the external model. So it's it's a constant effort to to minimize the difference between these two probability distributions. So the, let's say the big probability distribution that that represents the that that includes the outside world, and then the the internal probability distribution that you use to to predict the state of the outside world. So it's, there's a constant tension going on there, um, which I think in the in the Hegelian article, so in the article by Bonstra and Slachter that we read, I think this is called uh, habit. So a a, an organism, and, and actually this, this, this uh, theory is, is, the Friston's theory is very general, so you can use it both to describe a single cell or an entire brain, right? So there's, there's this constant, constant um, attempt to, to minimize the, 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 the distance between these two probability distributions. And I think that is what, what the, the, the people in the, in, the, uh, in the Hegelian article refer to us as the, as the habit. So it's this, this organism is constantly trying to, to, to keep itself um, to sustain itself, but in order to do that, it also constantly needs to change, and and that's basically where a kind of paradox arises, at least according to the Hegelian thinking, as far as I understand. So for me, just yeah. just to finish, this is for me very interesting because you have this very precise mathematical model, right? That I I can understand this in in mathematical details and it makes sense with respect to Bayesian statistics and stuff like that, and then you read kind of the, the the explanation from a hegelian point of view so it's it's actually a very a very interesting um a very interesting situation to 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 work with these two worlds yeah and i think that like specifically what you picked up on there when you know reading also the hegelian article is is the same thing i picked up on which is a a certain paradox of change which gets introduced when you consider it through the the Hegelian lens. And I just want to go into a little bit about what does that paradox of change mean? And I thought the article described it really well, which is when, when you're thinking from external cognition, when you're thinking about neuroplasticity, you have this sort of assumption that the brain is sort of infinitely malleable or infinitely plastic, that it can just change and it can change endlessly depending on external stimuli and stuff like that. But when you're operating from the internal cognition point of view, when you're taking into consideration the, the, uh, the internal model of the organism, you have to realize that the organism's only changing to remain the same. So it's, yeah. <laughs> so that paradox of change is, is really important to take into consideration. And what that, what that means is, is that people are not just sort of you know, if there's a if there's a lot of change in the external environment, people are not just going to be easily adapting to all of that change. They're going to be adapting to that change in relationship to their keeping their internal models as close to the same as they can. You know, so we get, we get all sorts of paradoxes here. I think in relationship to, let's say, the acceleration of modern technology, the changing environment, and let's say, human reaction to that change in political movements or something like that. Now, in regards to the generality of this model, and here trying maybe to connect to philosophy a little bit, because when it comes to philosophy, when it comes specifically to German idealism, we're, we're thinking about ideas. Now, in the articles you sent me, as it relates to the Markov blankets, that is the bounded system, they say it's a general model from single-celled organisms to brains. And they explicitly say it's about biological systems. So I have this question of the relationship between the boundedness of a biological system and, let's say, the boundedness of an ideational system. Because when Kant's talking about the a priori categories, he's talking about ideas, basically, you know, the ideality of space and timers. So the way I was thinking about it was that, you know, you could think about a single celled organism's boundary in the same way that you could think about a, a human's worldview as a boundary. What do you make of this distinction and what, what, what's at stake in thinking of uh, this? Um, so are we not talking about, about what it, yeah, so, so there's the question, what is this model actually describing? Is it, is, it, is it describing an internal model that has something to do with the way with our thoughts, like, you know, like we, we have thoughts and we model the world like that? 
or or is it more uh, a, a model that describes the organism you know as a whole right so what's in other words i mean i think also what what, what your question is related to the fact uh, to, to the question like like what's the relationship between this this model with its mark of blankets and its active inf inference um to, to and and consciousness so what's the what's the link there and i i don't know i haven't uh, i haven't uh, that that hasn't been uh, hasn't been part of, of of what i've been studying so far well let's 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 stay with the idea of the markov blanket again with the markov blanket representing sort of the boundary of a of the internal model of an organism and the boundary yeah. of an internal organism now um can you describe the general usefulness of thinking about life in this way? You know, like the, to think about it, you know, the way I've approached this in the literature is from the idea of autopoiesis. Yeah. Now, it seems to me like now this would be my speculation, but it seems like if the Markov blanket is a quantitative description, mathematical model of a internal dynamics of an organism, autopoiesis is basically trying to describe the qualitative dimension of the internal dimensions of, of, of an organism? What is it like to be a self-creating entity? So um, maybe let's go into a little bit about what is a Markov blanket? What does this boundary represent? And how can we think about this? Or how do you think about this? Well, 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 well I find very interesting. So I actually find it surprisingly difficult. <laughs> so I, as you know, so I, I, did, I prepared some slides with a lot of formulas on it and stuff like that and what i like about this model is that it's so precise so when when you when you talk about about these things in terms of philosophy and it's often not not exactly clear what you're talking about but but the the, the really nice thing about this this way of of, uh, of reasoning is that you have these these very precise um equations that that to a certain extent remove a lot of the philosophical ambiguity so if i if I could give you a kind of a very kind of high level bird's eye point of view answer to, to your question, what I really like about this, like you work with Bayesian, you describe everything in terms of Bayesian networks, uh, uh, random variables, mark of random fields, these are very, very precise concepts. And you actually have a language where you have no amb ambiguity anymore. The ambiguity that, so after reading these articles, the ones that I've read so far, so the mathematics is all quite clear to me, and also the, the link to thermodynamics and free energy and stuff like that. That's all clear to me. So my 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 big questions are 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 mostly well, this probability distribution. How should I interpret this? Um, is is where do where do the parameters of this probability distribution come from? How are they updated? Um, um, so how should I interpret this probability distribution in terms of organisms? And what is the connection to consciousness and things like that? But suddenly the, the, the conversation becomes a lot more precise because you have, you have like this bedrock of very precise, um, very precise language, uh, namely mathematics that you start with. And I think that, that at least for me, this is in incredibly appealing. I think in part, as it relates to the, like, let's say the, meta relationship between mathematics and philosophy as it relates to removing ambiguity or immersing oneself in ambiguity. I, th I think it's, it's that, you know, philosophy is, you know, whereas this, the, these mathematical models of, um, you know, Markov blankets, bounded living systems um, are giving you a sort of description of um, life philosophy is in life itself you know and and just you know just having a <laughs> just having an understanding of let's say thermodynamics or just having an understanding of machine learning uh that might give you a sort of precise model of of those disciplines but it doesn't say erase the ambiguity of life itself or so philosophy is is interested in that yeah but but um, yes yeah, yeah yeah i'm not saying that that we should reduce everything to um yeah to, to simple mathematics also I, I, if i would think that i wouldn't be here right but but what is very appealing is that um is that you, you do have this this kind of precision and also yeah. let's let's uh, i also want to make very clear that you know when i read these articles 
So, um, so they, they use Bayesian networks, they use Markov, uh, Markov blankets and things like that. They use, uh, in order to, 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 to judge the, 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 the difference between the internal model and the external model, they use something called the Kullback Liber divergence, which is a relative entropy, right? Now, all of these things are, to a great extent, arbitrary choices. You can use Bayesian networks, you can use Markov random fields, you can use factor graphs. So these are different types of mark of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of uh, graphical models. You have different ways to judge the, the distance between one probability distribution and another. So you have the schoolback library divergence, you also have alpha divergences and so on and so on. So if you make different choices, then you would get, get different mathematical outcomes, right? So, so to, to a great extent, you, these, these models are they are like drawings that that clarify ideas and so that's one thing so 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 it's it's it, these are kind of they're kind of drawings or, or or very precise formulations that can can stimulate your way of of thinking so that's one thing the second thing is also that that what is what is super interesting is that of course you can use these models to implement uh, ai models so, so these, um, so these, 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 the, the models of, of Carl Friston are, are being actively used to develop uh, AI uh, AI technologies. Um, so there's there's a clear link to, to to practical applications, right? And I know something that I also want to just bring up before we before I forget it is that so you talk about these paradoxes, right? But but often these paradoxes they arise because because people are not thinking in terms of processes. So basically, so so like Friston's model is is something like so so the um, so you, you get a sensory input, so you you update your internal model, you, know, you with your updated internal model, you you decide on an action that's going to help you to make your internal model even better, mm -hmm. so even better in tune with the environment, right? And that means that you do an action, and that action is done not only to get better sensory input that will update your internal model in a, in a, in a better way, but it will also affect the environment. Actions affect mm -hmm. the environment. So you have this, this, very interesting, um, this, this, this very interesting process that goes from sensory input, updated uh, internal model, uh, an interesting action that you do to get more sensory input, but that will also affect your, 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 uh, your external environment, right? But then you can, if you think of it in terms of a process, where you where you have these separate steps, then a lot of these of these paradoxes that I read in uh, that are are mentioned in this Hegel article, these paradoxes are not so difficult to understand. They're basically just as different aspects of a dynamical process. Now, in practice, of course, this is a very schematic way of thinking. So this this um, um, this, this model that we're talking about, it's it's uh, the reality is of course very messy. But I think that a lot of things are are much easier to to understand if you think in terms of processes right right and i mean i consider hegel to be a part of uh, the process philosophy tradition but let's go yeah. a little let's go a little bit into um the connection or the relevance in your view between the thermodynamics and the entropy side of things and the way in which it imply applies to the brain sciences the way that i understand it is that when we think of thermodynamics and entropy in terms of, let's say, increasing disorder or uncertainty, that this is sort of a, a proxy for surprise in the brain science models, that surprise here plays a big role in, in the sort of um, Friston's view of the brain. And that, you know, when we think about uh, what's going on inter internal to the, the brain as an anticipatory structure and the free energy minimization principle, it's trying to basically minimize surprise. So could you, could you, I mean, being shocked by the external environment and, and which would indicate that your model needs to be updated, right? And you need to, you need to change. Could you go into a little bit about how you understand this? Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is basically, so you have this complex probability distribution that you need to approximate, right? And I'm using some, some uh, if, if you, so, so we're working with probabilistic models, right? So, and in order to, to, to come up with this, with this approximation, you, you end up with something that, that is called, uh, that is called the free energy. And then this, this, this relative entropy. Now, this, this relative entropy, this is, this is always, a, this is a positive thing, right? And, um, 
and because it is um okay let's let's see how uh how um uh, how i should um explain this um so this relative entropy this this thing measures the the, the difference between the the approximation and and what is really out there so and so minimizing this that is basically the that's basically the the goal of the approximation yeah i so the the, the internal model is approximating anticipating and then you have the complex environment which cannot can never possibly be completely mapped but at the same time the internal model is trying to do the best it can to to minimize surprise and i think that that this this minimization of surprise is an interesting word that in the models they use to describe this is the the negative log yeah yeah does that resonate with yeah, you yeah so, so yes so okay so 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 there are i think yeah i think a better way to answer this is that so you can so you can think about about models in terms of energies and you can think about models in terms of probabilities right and you can go from one formulation to the other via basically a a uh, um uh, a, a transform in in, in uh, involving exponential functions and logarithms um so if you have an energy then you just take the exponent of minus that energy and that essentially turns it into a probability now for some methods for some problems it's it's convenient to think in terms of energies and that's basically done in in the world of physics and in in for other problems it's more convenient to um to think in terms of uh, of probabilities that's the that's the world of statistics right so um so to, to to a great extent they are they are very um they're very equivalent ways to think about about physical models I'm just trying I'm just trying to to get at here the relationship between the way in which Hegel's understanding spiritual process and and processes of intelligibility as basically in relationship to let's say models for the sake of this conversation he'll use language related to the concept or the idea but you know it's the language that's being used in your field is uh, a self evidencing of your internal model and it's in relationship to the surprise which i think in hegelian language would be called the negativity because it it's the difference between the self evidencing model and the difference well, that, that would then be the, that would then be the relative entropy. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the difference basically between what your what what your approximation says and what the what the true model says. So the difference between these two two distributions that would be the the, the relative entropy. So the kullback Leibert divergence, um, which is what you want to minimize. You want to minimize that difference. Yeah. So and in principle that that could be zero, right? And then you could have you could have a perfect internal model for 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 your for your external probability distribution so what you're trying to do is to minimize that difference and this mm -hmm. is exactly what so this this so this is it's really interesting because this is a computational method that that you use to train probabilistic machine learning methods so based on on neural networks so things like variational autoencoders and now we have these these diffusion models that are used for example to to generate these very realistic images they are based on these on these principles. They are based on, on on these variational principles. So you have a very so 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 what we're talking about here is is this link between between you have like practical machine learning uh, models. You have um, you have models of the brain now that are are making use of the same mathematical principles, and then you have philosoph philosophers that are engaging with these mathematical descriptions. So that's like a really interesting landscape. So on the one, so from from practical applications to these ideas, to people who are, who are using these models to to think about about consciousness, about life, about um, about um, um, yeah, about living systems. And then you have the uh, philosophers who kind of uh, have their own uh, uh, problems and interests and 
and they are engaging with these models. So that's like three sides or like three um, mm. uh, three corners in in in, in uh, um, three three different perspectives, right? Right. Yeah. Um, it seems it seems to me like at least in terms of the literature I've read, as it relates to the philosophical interested in this, is as it relates to say, let's call it the dialectics of the brain, as it relates to this minimization of difference, we call relative entropy. Uh, with the sort of hypothetical possibility of a perfect internal model, which I, <laughs> maybe we never, you know, the, the, the perfect internal model, you know, reminds me of, you know, the way in which you would criticize the uh, perfect being, you know, the guru who has perfect being, you know, they would right, say I have right. the perfect yeah. internal model. Yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to, well, my, my, my aim here, which is, it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm, my very aim in this conversation, I feel like is a, an attempt to minimize the difference of relative entropy in relationship to, to, to our different language games and, and trying to, to approach something. But I want, my goal here is to try to see in what way these models of the brain sciences have some relevance to discussions we might have otherwise about, for example, gurus with the perfect model uh, or, um, or, or, or rivalrous dynamics between different uh, mimetic uh, ecologies and, and, and stuff like, and stuff like this. Um, so, you know, I think one way or one window into this possible link of, of discourses is the dialectics of the brain, which in the paper stated it was a, a tension between an isolated entity and an interconnected web of brains. So you, you and, 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 you know, this, this, uh, tension between the, uh, secluded and the open model, as they call it, is uh, a tension which appears even on the conceptual horizon of um, Friston's own theory, nam namely that there are cognitivists and inactivists who have different positions as it relates to the meaning of, of Friston's theory. But here to like sort of pose this as a question is that the brain here has to deal with because it can't have the perfect internal model or because it can't have the perfect sort of being it has to constantly oscillate between a sort of secluded existence and an open existence in an interconnected web of of others how do you how do you make sense of this how, how do you make sense of what you understand of these models as it relates to these problems that the brain just oscillates between throughout its life history yeah, well, well, well these, these, um, so these, you have these extremes, right? So you have a, what is it, cognitivism and, and activism, right? And these seem, these seem to be extremes that correspond to to certain, to certain, um, um, to certain stages in a dynamic process. So, and in this model of of Friston, so you make all kinds of assumptions that um, this random variable. Um, and that random value, but these these two run these random variables are isolated from each other with this, with respect to this Markov blanket. So you can you can just write down this very precise probabilistic model, which 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 is a dynamic model because it includes time, and you can kind of see well this random variable at that point will will affect that one, but not not this one. So that's what these Markov blankets are doing. So they isolate certain random variables from other random variables, and and and. And you have also this dynamic aspect. So there you can kind of, kind of, you can, you can kind of see like, well, well, people have have been adopting, um, have been adopting different views on on what's going on with respect to 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 this, uh, you know, with respect to cognitivism and activism. And you can say like, well, that's that's emphasizing this aspect of the model or or another aspect of the model. So so it provides also a way of unifying different perspectives and kind of seeing that they are. They're talking about the same thing, but they're emphasizing uh, different aspects of the same process. I mean, one one aspect of the model, the more secluded cognitivist end, the other aspect of the model, the more open inactivist lens, you know, what do, what do you think the brain is struggling with on one side or the other? Like, is it regards to being secluded? It's in relationship to 
Is it always in relationship to sort of minimizing the relative entropy out, out, outside of it versus someone who, which is, a, on the other hand, someone who's more open, is capable of handling more openness, capable of handling more disturbance, capable of handling more surprise? Can we yeah, think, think about yeah. it in this way? Well, well we, have this, this, we have this gap, right? So I think that's what you would call the negativity. So this, this gap between your internal model and the external world. Yeah. which you are constantly trying to minimize, right? So if that if that kind of gets very, very big, if that gap gets very big, then your role becomes completely unpredictable. And mm -hmm. and that that is, I think, that if you if you kind of... Which kinda, is too much for your internal model to, 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 to handle. Right. If, but on the other hand, if it's too predictable, then you get bored, right? So then, then there yeah. is... There's, then, 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 then that is also not... not, not um, not, so that's that's actually where I I have a, after reading these articles like I am like I have a lot a lot of questions right so one of the questions for example is well and I think it's mentioned in one of the articles well why don't we just go and sit in a dark room right and 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 make everything super predictable we don't seem to do that either we don't seem to do that no so, so there's I, so because uh, I don't think we just the thing is we don't just see surprise as n negative. In in right. now yeah. it's called now now th now that's the crucial thing is that the the concept of negativity here in Hegel is not so much negative in the sense of um, bad. It's not a moralistic term. It's a difference. But the idea here is that at a certain stage of cognitive development, at a certain stage of intellectual process, a certain disturbance or surprise could be perceived as negative. Whereas at another stage of cognitive development or intellectual process, that disturbance or surprise could be seen as positive, could be seen as exciting, even right. motivating, even motivating. Yeah. yeah so that, that's I'm 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 pretty sure that that people have been thinking about that, um, but I, I don't really know what the explanation is with in, with respect to Friston's model. I don't think I've heard some discussions around this, and I and I don't think it's been thought through too too deeply. I think this is what interests me the most is is that the 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 cognitive state, let's say, of the theorists who are um, playing with these ideas of Friston's free energy principle might have a role in the way they perceive surprise. Or the way they, because if you if you see surprise as purely negative, meaning that you want to get rid of it completely, then you end up in a situation which is actually doesn't make any sense in our actual world in terms of how we behave. Like, let me do something a little weird now. And I want to make a connection between this idea specifically that I just talked about and thus spoke Zarathustra. So All right. the way the way I taught Thus Spoke Zarathustra was that you could see Zarathustra's character oscillating between seclusion and openness. He goes away to a cave by himself for 10 years at the start of the book, which presumably suggests that he wasn't too happy with his external social environment and interacting with other brains. Right. And then he returns to the world, and specifically as he's returning to the world, he encounters a priest who says, you cannot love other humans. They're not lovable. They're too imperfect. But, you know, nonetheless, he goes back to the world and he goes on these oscillations between isolation, seclusion and openness to others and and so forth. But it's it's precisely that what we find in this tension between seclusion and openness is, I think, a key to the spiritual process itself, understanding how to navigate that tension. Yeah, but this is the this is the old discussion of uh, you know pro prohibition versus ritual, right? So this is one of the reasons why why you know this this idea of to just removing all all rules and then living in in uh, you know living uh, in a world that where desire is free is a, is a pipe dream, right? So you need to have some kind of structure to your world. Um, otherwise, then you have this this incredible distance between your internal models and the external world. The world becomes unpredictable, and 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 that is a very painful state of being, right? So, but the nice thing, so what I find fascinating is now we have precise mathematical models to to describe these type, kind of things, 
and and we have the powerful machines the computers and the you know the gpus to implement them so now you can you can implement these things and then just run them and see what what happens right so i'm i'm, I'm kind of so have you heard of a of a discipline called computational philosophy i've heard of it but you'd have to tell me about it no i don't know i'm asking you i mean it that should that should exist now right i mean so that should be a discipline computational philosophy where you kind of because you know if you if you look at like the the philosophies of hegel or of whitehead and and so on and so on so you can you can basically just implement a lot of these things and then just simulate a group of people that are living according to these principles and then see whether whether it works or not right i mean a lot of philosophers they have an anthropology right they have an idea like this is how people work like like for example nietzsche has the will to power um you have, you have whitehead with his concrescence you have hegel with the master slave um, uh, relationships and so on and so on so you can actually kind of start implementing these things and then and then you know, see what they whether they kind of lead to good results or not and what i mean what what would that look like practically like when you say you know we we have these you know when you like for example i i i i kind of go blank a little bit when you say we have these machines and we can implement these things and we have the mathematical models and we could run you know we could run processes and see see results and outcomes ahead of, what 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 does that mean practically for for me for you well we could well, I, first of all you could for our I mean, relationship if you if you implement an if you implement an anthropology in a computer program, you can kind of start seeing like which anthropologies are seem to be giving outcomes that are closer to what we see in the real world than others. You can start seeing well, this anthropology doesn't it apparently doesn't really seem to lead to any of the results that we see in the real world. And once you you have that nailed, then you can, I mean, actually that's gonna happen, right? I mean, then you can do predictions. I mean, you can that's it's already going on, right? That there's all these these. AI methods that are trying to predict um, how how humans how humans work and then, then use that to to um, to make various things happen. I mean, one of the crucial aspects of Hegel's philosophy is that he suggests that we cannot uh, jump ahead of our time, meaning we cannot see into the future. Right. Now, one of the things that you're suggesting here with these models is that we have good enough models of what life is, or we have good enough models of what brains are that we could run simulations and basically identify um, perhaps social political programs, which are dead ends from the get go because they don't have a valid anthropology. Is, is that what you're saying? Well, well, actually a bit more, more modest. I'm, so I, mean, I, I try to, to kind of avoid activism and, 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 uh, and utopian thinking in terms of like, we should sure. do this and we should do that. It, these are just interesting tools to, to, to because people have, have said, many thinkers have models of how humans work, right? So Nietzsche mm. says it's will to power that, that drives people and will to power looks like this and that. And then Freud has its own has his own model. Girard has his own model, and so on. Yeah, here's Girard finally. So, um, so and then, but these things can be tested, right? You can you can start implementing these, and then and then see how communities of of um, of individuals that that you have um, that you have uh, provided with these types of anthropologies, and you can kind of see well, well, does that give? Does that do, do these simulations make any sense? Do they give? results that we can see in the real world. I mean, it seems to me that, that, that a lot of these disciplines, like probabilistic modeling, machine learning, AI, uh, philosophy, anthropology, I mean, it, you can see this is enormous breakdown between all the different disciplines. Yeah, so you're saying it's a unifying model for these disciplines or potentially unifying model for these disciplines? What does that mean in terms, like, would it have an impact on on politics or community organization or? or, well, or... Obviously, it's a bit, I think you should kind of think of it as like the, the, the book printing, the era of book printing had an enormous influence on, on human thinking, right? Because suddenly you had this technology where you could put, put this, your talks, your thoughts into, into these books that you could cheaply print and then distribute. And then people would write books as reaction, which was also distributed widely, and it was cheap to do that. So and that 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 caused an enormous amount of change in, in in our society and in our ways of thinking. And now we have these, now we have all these these evolutions going on with respect to um, with with 
what we are discussing right now will that will basically drive our thinking in new directions could you could you speculate a little bit about how how you yeah could you speculate a little bit more about about how you think that would look have you have you well, thought about that well, it's, it's you just look around you, right? I mean, just like the digital, the digital networks, uh, the Facebook algorithms. Now we have Chat GTP and things like that. So we're just at the start of this. So we're, we're kind of, um, yeah, the the I mean, it's the the the, the, mach the machine intelligence is uh, it's it's making it possible to to answer questions that were not uh, not answerable for, uh, only a few years ago, right? And you right. have now you have AI now that can can generate computer programs. You have AI that can do mathematical reasoning. So, so this is a, yeah, this is a very interesting development. Mm -hmm. Could, I'm just I'm I'm still I'm still I feel like there's 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 something missing. Are you you were saying that um, all of let's say anthropology, biology, computer science. Uh, all of these different fields have divergent models. Are you suggesting that this is a convergent model? Well, I think I'll, I'll, that that the future is. Uh, it, it, I, I think that what what will, what you will see more and more in the future is 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 uh, collaborations ac across disciplines, which is what mm -hmm. we are doing right here. Um, Absolutely, and I, I think we will see that more and more that will become much more much more important. Um, well, transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary thinking. Yeah, but I mean, like, okay, good. So the, the the Hegelians have been thinking about about certain things that are, you know, they've been thinking about this for a couple of hundred years, and then they will interact with these computer scientists who are coming up with these very simple mathematical models of the brain, like the, the these these variational the variational base, these free energy models of the brain, and then the, the Hegelians they start then asking these 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 questions, like, well, we have these philosophical questions, but we've been discussing this for 150 years or whatever. What's your answer to that? And then, okay, then the computer scientists or the or the, the machine learners or the or the Bayesian statisticians they, they scratch their heads and then they, they they need to update their models, right? But then and then and then the the mathematical models they might provide some some very precise formulations of 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 what, for example, what does dialectics mean? What does this what does lack mean? What what does tension mean? So for, for we we seem to have converged on on the Kullback Lieber divergence between the the variational model. And and uh, the, the 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 true probability distribution. So that that distance that that seems to be the negativity. But that's mm -hmm. an ex suddenly we we have we have an, a model because it's only a model, but we have a model that makes a a rather ambiguous concept from philosophy suddenly very very precise. Even if it's only in the form of a, maybe it's just a metaphor, right? Or maybe it's just you can see these computer programs as as illustrations. But suddenly you have a very, very precise way of talking about these things. Well, it seems to me like in the history of philosophy in the last 200 years, there is this bifurcation between, um, and this is these are stereotypes, but I think insofar as they're stereotypes, they might you know, have some truth to them, which is you know, the continental philosophers are usually talking in very open language. You know, someone, you know, perhaps someone like you would say, um, it's not a very precise language. It's it's got too much ambiguity in the language, and then analytic philosophers are much more concerned with precision. They're much more con concerned with um, eliminating as much ambiguity as possible to get conceptual sort of rigor, let's say. Um, and it, it it seems to me like the stereotypes leveled at at both these philosophers. On the one hand, the analytic philosophers are seen as kind of lifeless. Whereas the continental philosophers are seen as too poetic, um, and so these types of uh, differences come up for me when you're talking about, um, on the one hand, getting you know very precise mathematical models and 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 uh, you know eliminate, eliminating ambiguity versus the que the questions that that come to my mind is yeah, so what for 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 life for uh, <laughs> you know. For our experience of life, for our engagement with life, what 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 does this mean? Well, you can you, that means basically you can you can go go off the rails in, in two ways, right? You can either either kind of start obsessing about about details and mathematical precision and 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 certainty, 
or you can you you can become so vague that 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 thousands and thousands of people um, uh, keep on discussing the, the 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 meaning of your books, right? So so there there has to be. I mean, there's like two extremes that you should probably avoid. Sure. And then it's also it's also like like you can have you can but you can have both, right? I mean, you can you can have like a, a uh, you, suppose that you can read Nietzsche, right? So Nietzsche is very you know, it's, it's it's not an analytic. He's political, for sure. Nietzsche is very politic, political, but you know, you have like, like the you have the will to power and uh, sure, uh, yeah, yeah. and all of that stuff. So then you can say like, well, why don't why well let let's try to be very precise about this, right? So we we, we read Nietzsche and we kind of we read what what does he say about this and that and and then we kind of say like, well, you know, this seems to be his model about how humans work. So they're driven by one thing, the will to power. Which is a bit tricky because then actually that means that the ressentiment is also the will to power. So we have we already have a kind of a bit of a of a paradox there, right? So how are we going to implement that? But but these are very good, uh, very good. Um, this is very good exercise because the problem is that people are very very fond of, of of vagueness because then they can just give put their own story about it, right? So you you just read a thinker and especially a thinker like like Nietzsche. I mean, he's all over the place. Nietzsche is like all over the place. He always he says A over, over here and he says not A in a different position, right? So then people, that's why you know, people claim that, he, you know, he's, he lies. Uh, Nietzsche was a proto-Nazi. No, because here he said something that, that seems to go against against this, this way of thinking. But well, then Nietzsche said position, contradictory things. Yeah, Nietzsche is like, yes, but but then, then you're like more in the... But, so this is another uh, discussion that we had, right? So where if you have, if you are... If you are kind of full of these, of these these paradoxes and these these, um, um, so so we have all the, also this tension between between ritual and 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 prohibition, right? So what what are you actually trying to do? Are you kind of are you kind of trying to set up a ritual, giving people a ritual by reading a book, or are you are you trying to do some 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 serious thinking? And, and I think many philosophers are trying to, to do both at the same time. They're trying sure. to create some kind of ritual space where people have these insights and certain experiences, and 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 on the other hand, they're also trying to to, to have some 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 uh, uh, some structured thinking. But just it's good to know in what kind of space you are, right? Are you? I mean, I, I hear people reading Hegel like some kind of mystical experience right i read hegel i don't really understand what it's what it means but it has an effect on me and then on the other hand here we have this article that that applies uh, hegel to to a very precise mathematical theory of of of, uh, of of living systems well i think it's both right just like the way you're describing active inference like it can have an effect on you and then it can have an effect on on the world because it, it it changes like it it literally like well specifically the two biggest dimensions of thought as it relates to Hegel from my understanding would be on the one hand it teaches you dialectical thinking meaning like one of the examples we saw in that paper is like oh the brain is in a constant tension between being a secluded entity and a social entity and there's no real end to that oscillation there that realizing that that I'm caught between these antinomies is kind of the end. And now I can operate from a standpoint of, of thinking, or I can operate from a standpoint of knowing, which takes that into conclude, which takes that into consideration, which changes the way I relate to social life and changes the way I relate to my inner life. So yeah, but but I, but I would argue that that if you then if you then read these 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 theories, right, and then then a lot of what Hegel is talking about is it's not so mysterious at all anymore. Well, it's not about uh, preserving Hegel's mystery. It's kind of like science. Yeah. Like it's not about preserving Hegel's mystery. I'm not that. I, I I mean that's not the way I approach it. Um, I approach Hegel in the same way that I approach science, and I have the same sort of reproach to, like for example, mystics who are against science because it eliminates mystery, but it doesn't science opens up mystery <laughs> like the more you understand science the more the world becomes mysterious and i think in an equal way like you know take hegel out of the picture and let's just consider dialectical thinking as opposed to like say for example the scientific method i think the scientific method opens mystery well 
I think dialectical thinking likewise opens mystery. So it's, again, with the example I was just giving about sort of, for example, understanding this actually, you know, because, and these are very practical examples when we talk about the dialectics of seclusion and openness or being alone in social life. Because a lot of people don't think about that dialectically. And you could actually make a big life choice where you undialectically choose one or the other or get stuck in one or the other, right? Like someone who goes off to a monastery and says, ah, to hell with all the humans. Or, or someone who gets stuck in a traditional social order where you can't escape other humans. And all of your thoughts are reduced to the normative social order of the other humans. So to me, again, dialectical thinking doesn't, it's not about, I would like it if Hegel was not mysterious in that sense, like rather let's understand what he's saying so that we can open new types of, you know, encounter with the mystery, let's say. Yeah, well, I, I find it's quite interesting to um, to confront these two, these two ideas. I think that both of the... Um, both of these ideas became more interesting because they were brought into dialogue with each other. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that it's it's like, you know, on the one hand, you have potential, let's say, the reductionist view of the brain. We have, again, neuronal scans. Uh, you see the patterns, the wirings, the synaptic connections and so forth. On the other hand, you can have a view of the brain as mediating a constant tension in a life world. And these are completely different views of the brain, but I mean, we don't need to deconstruct one or the other. We can sort of think about the way in which they relate to each other, right? On the one hand, you have the neuronal wirings as sort of proxies for subjective experience, the uh, neurological correlates of experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then on the other hand, you have the fact that we never experience anything outside of a social con context and a, and, a, and a social tension, you know, from the time we're born to the to the time we die, unless you're an old person living in Japan by yourself <laughs> or something like that. Right. So just here saying that, like, I want to sort of be clear that I think one of the important dimensions of Hegel is basically what we're talking about is being trained and and part of reading Hegel and 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 like the sort of the sutra uh, to use language that that will sort of resonate with you like the sutra of reading Hegel is to train yourself in these dialectical reversals where what you thought was your identity is not you get surprised right so you're constantly encountering these negativities of identity or these gaps between what you think is your self model and the reality of the situation or the real of the situation which i think is coming up here in the sort of friston theory very uh clearly uh this constant gap this dealing with this constant gap on the one hand you can never get the perfect model on the other hand um you know, you can find yourself in a complete disorder or a total surprise, which in Hegelian language we might call death, I suppose. What is that? What is it? What, 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 what goes through your head when I say that? Um, yeah, that, that's actually interesting to... Uh, yeah, but the, the, then you can kind of see that... that so the, one of the, the the things that I was wondering about in uh, when, when I was reading all this this uh, these theories the, the theories about uh, about free energy models and stuff like that is that um, so what do you have if you, how do you so do you have these mark of mark of blankets of mark of blankets right so yeah. a cell a cell is a mark of blanket but then you can you can kind of see an org organ is a mark of blanket of mark of blankets. And yeah, so, so it's, it's I mean, and just and, and when we talk about this is a, the, a mathematical model, but this is actual biological life. You have a single celled organism, you have a multicellular organism, you have right. an organism which is composed of, you know, so these are all Markov blankets bound bounded units of information. Yeah, so right? A cell can be considered a Markov blanket, but but then a, a human being with a brain can is also a, a Markov blanket. So so you have Markov blankets within these Markov blankets. And then you, of course, you have like you have like um, 
you, you can kind of then how are different cells or, or humans interacting so then you can have another another level of modeling right where you where you you, you model these these agents that are uh, that are interacting with each other so so, so you, you end up with this with these incredible vistas right so you can kind of start modeling you know cells and organs and then entire humans and then interacting humans that interact with each other so so that that's that and that that's on the horizon right so that you have these these enormous these enormous uh, opportunities of, of simulation right and, and probably in the beginning it will be very with very precise purposes right so modeling let's say the spread of the coronavirus or something like that that's already being done right but I mean, you can do that. You can have all kinds of, of, of uh, you can study all kinds of processes with that, right? So, so we, we so, so for example, the, the problem of desire, right? So, that, so, so we have this, we have this. So we have this, this. Um, it seems that 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 you have this this mimetic desire. So you want what other people want. So how do you how would you put that in this in this model? That's my one well, of the that, questions that, that, that I have. That's so, so that's the connection I wanted to. That's the connection I wanted to work towards slowly. And the the reason I wanted to work towards that that slowly, or how I first introduced the idea that we might work towards that slowly, is this this idea that what happens in in again in German idealism with with the Kantian transition is the the transcendental a priori categories, which is basically the idea here. I was saying is our our worldviews or our idea spaces. Our mimetic spaces are these Markov blankets. That's what I'm saying. Is is that in the articles we read, they were saying Markov blankets the, that they're very general for biological systems, from the single-celled organism to the human brain, and saying, is can mimesis be studied in this way in in your language? Well, well, that, that must be possible. I mean, it must be possible to 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 somehow extend this this um, this framework because this is just, I mean, it's, it's very general. So this is this is all Bayesian statistics, um, and then you use variational inference to do approximate uh, uh, computation in these in these uh, in these models. Um, so so it should be possible to somehow uh, formulate that in in those terms. I don't know if anybody. I don't know to what extent these these ideas have been used to to model interacting systems. Right. I mean, I think it would be extremely difficult, um, extremely complex. Well, it depends on what 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 kind of systems you are modeling, right? If you're just modeling a couple of cells that are interact, tra- interacting with each other, that should not be so complicated. Well, uh, depending the thing- on the level of detail, of course, but uh, you you could easily come up with some kind of proof of concept right so I, I don't really so again i i've just started explore so i know the mathematics quite well so that's really nice so i understand the mathematics yeah but i if i don't i have not read the entire literature of of uh of of uh, carl friston's uh, ideas so I'm, I'm, i hope to i will do that by by the time that i will give the presentation for your course on the on the um and the science of logic um, so I will have a, a much better view on, on what what has been done, but but the logical a log, logical question is what we can can we can we model what happens when we we, we model interacting systems. So to what extent do we need to um, do we need to uh, um, to change these these fundamental uh, the fundamental approach? Well, one of the ideas that came up when I was doing research in the papers you sent was that it said when you have multiple Markov boundaries interacting. The qualities of their measuring uh, lead to um, the, the, their causal effects failing. Like there's a lot of failure internal to the system when you have what a lot of interact. What does that mean, failure here? Well, when you have multiple, the way I'm interpreting it is if you have m- multiple Markov boundaries interacting, because all of their internal models are being exposed to so much so much so much so much phenomena that they, that they can't anticipate that there's a lot of internal failure oh yeah right well if you have if you have uh if you have just static things around you then then it's very predictable right but if you have well, this agents, is totalitarianism yeah yes yeah yeah so there's there's a lot of um i mean and you can kind of start looking at phase transitions and stuff like that right i mean people must be 
I mean, that these things are, are going on, right? So, you know, you, using physics to, to, uh, to simulate, using thermo, to the thermodynamic ideas and phys- ideas from physics to model entire, uh, you know, civilized societies and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, these, these things are possible and, and that there is, there's research in these, in these, uh, in these topics. Right. I mean, I'm just sorry. Yeah, like, what what is the phase transition between between a, a society where you have a reasonable amount of freedom and a totalitarian society? Is there are there phase transitions there? What do they look like? Can can we predict them? Can we can we can we see them when when we uh, harvest data from social media and stuff like that? So can can that be predicted? Can can we intervene and and avoid these things? And then who, who decides what should be avoided and things like that? So it's like. We live in very interesting times. We definitely live in very interesting times. Um, well, let me let me run an idea by you and see see what you think. So, the way the way I would apply some of these ideas to to thinking about political systems is that, like for example, a, a monarchical system would be like, for example, you know, you, you study for example the history of the British monarchy. Mm. And the British and it's interesting because when you talk about Markov blankets and these bounded systems, um, you can frame these things in terms of uh, families because they have uh, dependent networks. And they as a, on the one hand, you can have a dependent network. On the other hand, you could have a I think they called it a, a free network or some uh, depend uh, rant. No, a, a dependency network is uh, where the boundaries are um, set by the parents of the uh, of the 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 system and the random field is where the boundaries are uh, set in relationship to neighboring nodes so you you could have on the one hand a dependent network on the one hand a, a random field apparently now you take the idea of the the markov blanket you apply it say for example to the history of the british monarchy and well a monarchical system is trying to get everything to reflect its own image or its own boundary, you know, its own set of ideas. And it's trying to protect those at all costs. And it's a a very conservative boundary. Uh, No matter how much the external world is changing, they're going to try to interpret that and, and sublate that in Hegelian language to keep it the same. So like, for example, over the last 100 years, the British royal family has gone from uh, adapting to uh, the telecommunication system in the early 20th century to today they have Instagram, for example. But right. they're keeping up the image, so to, so to speak, in, and, and, and they're constantly dealing with the threat of being dissolved, you know, and, and why do they exist and, and, and stuff like that. But my point here is that a type of monarchical system is one in which you have Um, a very sort of static set of boundaries which will maintain themselves at irrespective of the change in the external environment. Whereas I think we could describe, for example, let's say an anarchist system or some other type of system uh, where there's going to be much more, let's say, flexibility or much more uh, changeability. Uh, what 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 do you make? How do you make sense of these ideas? Yeah. So what you're trying to play with here is to to apply these these ideas with Markov blankets and and um, and and uh, yes, you're trying to apply these ideas to more more to cultural situations like groups of people who are interacting exactly. with each other, things like that. I see no reason why you couldn't do that. Mm-hmm. That makes that makes t- total sense. Um, I don't know to, to which extent that has been done. Um, well, I think that one of the motivations of, uh, it hasn't come out yet, but one of the motivations with my systems and subjects book is to play with these languages, you know, play with the languages of system science, thermodynamics on the one hand and continental philosophy, sort of the, the sort of say raw subjectivity on the other hand and, and try to try to think them together, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. It's basically taking very general models of systems, um, which have a mathematical dimension to them, and trying to think um, human subjectivity, 
social systems, cultural systems, and, and stuff like this. Yeah, but and trying just, to think, yeah, their interaction. Yeah, but so this this is what we talked about before, right? So you have all these different disciplines that are now suddenly coming together, right? So so you have mm -hmm. probabilistic modeling. You also have causal modeling, which is another another interesting aspect of these theories, right? So so causation, um, which is a, a, a researcher called Judy Pearl has developed a very big framework to think about causation. Um, yep. So, so then you, you have the, the practical link with machine learning, with AI, which then can make use of, 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 of uh, large amounts of data from social media. Um, you, you, you can then think about these things in terms of philosophy and anthropology. You can start applying these to social engineering. So these are like, so, so there's, a, there's a huge opportunity here for testing out ideas on a large scale and also applying them. Absolutely. And I think that's, yeah, that's, that's one of the things that I hope um, th this, this course can bring is, 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 uh, is, is again, not just a, a historicity of sort of what did Hegel think, but more, you know, really getting into how is this thinking working and how can it be applied to, uh, yeah, modern, modern science? Because I think that where the philosophy leaves you is, with the challenge to think spirit, right? Thinking spirit, thinking world spirit, thinking about all human society, all spiritual history, and 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 what it what is it, and and what's my what's what's my role in it, and how do these modern ideas of, um, you know, machine learning, statistics, and stuff like that, how do they relate to this larger process? Yeah, so, so, so the what the world spirit that would, would be the the joint probability distribution over all random variables. <laughs> right, right. Like, uh, yeah. We, the, th the thing is, is that it's it, what's not clear to me is how do we sync up the language games? How do yeah. we know that we're talking about the same thing? Like, I feel like, like that's that's like where a lot of my mind goes. Like, like when I was writing systems and subjects, when it, it's not out yet, but while I was writing systems and subjects, it was basically you know, the capacity to accept the language games of system science, accept the language games of continental philosophy, and throw them together. And I think it requires that disposition, right? Meaning it requires the disposition of, okay, I really like this Bayesian, I really like these Bayesian statistics. I really like the precision of this mathematics. I really, you know, I can see the utility of that. I get that. I'm locked in there. Then, then the other side say I'm really interested in Whitehead and Gerard's language games, you yeah, know, and, right. and and I like I like the ideas of concrescence, say, and I yeah. like the ideas of the rivalry and the scapegoating and the obstacle models and stuff like that. What's the discourse here between the two, and and how do we found the discourse and how do we even start the discourse and 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 so forth? I mean, that's that's where my mind is. Yeah, right. And yeah, and, and how many how many people who are interested in statistical modeling and machine learning are also interested in Whitehead and Girard? And vice and vice versa, right? So I, what I'm saying is let's look for like here's my this would be like a Hegelian proposal is what major discourses which have major uh, effects and consequences in the world what the, the space of these discourses how do they interact what discourses are not communicating or interacting and how could we potentially birth new ideas in facilitating such an interaction because it would require a certain cognition namely let me bring it back to a point i was making earlier it would require a cognition which was very open to surprisal mm-hmm mm -hmm. You know, so it wouldn't be a cognition that's looking for a perfect model. So it would be a cognition that is, okay, I'm not going to get the perfect model. I'm open to the mystery here. And I'm not going to take this as a negativity that my model is shattered. Right. Because, yeah. because necessarily my model will be shattered. But I think that Friston has, has done that to to, uh, to 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 some extent. I know that he has an article. I looked at it some time ago. But he has an article on on uh, on 
uh, on Freud and and on uh, on, oh, nice. on the, the variational uh, the variational uh, models. So so there's there's a lot of, of um, interdisciplinary thinking going on. And do you have a uh, any sort of um, knowledge of of the connection between Friston and Freud? Um, well, I think he was just just looking at, at these these Freudian ideas like pre pleasure principle and things like that, and trying exactly. to see whether whether this made made sense in in uh, in in uh, in this uh, in this free energy minimization uh, model. My spontaneous reaction was that it, it it sounds the free energy minimization model sounds a lot like the relationship between the pleasure principle and the death drive, where here the reduction of surprise is literally the function of the pleasure principle like pleasure is about reducing tension for freud like you and our minds fundamentally want pleasure like that's mm -hmm. the most uh, infantile for freud anyway that's the most infantile drive now the death drive is about basically not getting the pleasure object <laughs> Meaning you can't actually, you can't basically, pleasure doesn't function to totally reduce uncertainty or totally reduce tension. That at a certain point you come to an underlying death drive and that would be to me linked to this negative log of surprisal. Like if I was here being very liberal and very open with playing with the potential synergies between these languages. Yeah, in so this is in the yeah. interest of facilitating the discourse. Yeah, so I think think this this is this is like very a very rich source of new ideas, right? Okay, good. So we have this model. We have the first model. <laughs> now we have the ideas of Freud. Good. Let's see whether we can does 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 this actually make sense? Make sense? Can we kind of make sense of what, what is going on here? So. But you have this but again. So it's this 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 availability of this extremely precise language um, of of statistics. So yeah. not just mathematics, right? So we are we are dealing here with with um, with probabilistic models and random variables. So you can you can put real things in there, right? So you can say like you know this model is that behavior, and we can measure that. So you can also put in measurements. Uh, so yeah. that so that that suddenly gives you a you know I mean. I think we should we should kind of you know we, we should kind of if it doesn't exist then we should now um, claim the, the the birth of computational philosophy right because I think yeah, that yeah, will... no, I'm I'm totally open to these to these discourses birthing something new like I even would like here just throw my hat in the ring with with like the language you use for Gerard and just here throw an idea about what re relation it has to the Friston free energy principle as well. Like, for example, when people are developing object model rivalries, like I want that object because that person has that object and that represents the perfect object for me. Is this an attempt to minimize the free? The, is this an attempt to minimize the free energy? Yeah, well, I mean, an obvious way to, to kind of model that is that, well, maybe you, you let's say you have a probability uh, distribution that that models um, that models desire, right? This is what a so let's say a cell, right? And a, a cell goes for certain products. You know, let's say that it has a, you know, let's say it has sugar and ox oxygen, right? So then it has a probability. Well, maybe we should make it a bit more complicated because cells don't really have any mimetic desire, right? But suppose you have entities, right? So you model some very simple entities. You can either go, for, it can go after the red cubes, it can go after the green cubes, right? And the, the thing is that how does an entity entity decide whether it wants a red cube or a green cube? Well, it just looks at the entities around them, right? If everybody around around me wants a red cube, I'll also want a red cube. Right. Well, this is so then uh, you this can kind of say, well, mimicry. Yeah, well, that's mimetic desire, right? You want what what you want what what those around you want, right? But you can easily you easily model that again in terms of a, a, a of a divergence, a Kullback-Leiber divergence, so an, a relative entropy, right? Then you could say, well, what's the probability distribution of of the of of of, of describing what 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 the agents around me want, and then I'm going to minimize the, the 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 relative entropy with that probability distribution for my internal probability distribution. I'm just I'm just saying I'm just making a suggestion, right? But you can easily you can easily formulate um, all kinds of ideas in 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 this framework 
in terms of probability distributions and, and, and distances between probability distributions. And the nice thing about it is that it's computationally tractable, so you can actually implement it. And what would that implementation look like? Well, it would just be in a simulation where you would just simulate all kinds of entities that, that interact with each other. I mean, when I was working on my doctorate, there were some people in my department that were working on simulating the, glo the idea of the global brain, the idea that the internet sort of functions like a brain. Yeah. You know, and one of the problems with the, the models is that they're always too simplistic to the actual phenomena. Meaning the, the simulation is never going to really be able to take into consideration all of the variables of the actual planet. Yeah, but I think, that, I think that you should be very concrete. So often, often, uh, often people work on, on, on very... Uh, so you, if you have a clear goal and you have a clear criterion for success, then, then you, you, might, you might progress a lot faster. Um, so let, let, for example, now we have all these... these, these uh, these uh, these uh, AIs that can 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 interact with humans, right? So you have a, like you have like a clear you have like a clear criterion for success, right? How can we how can we develop an AI that can that can talk to to, to humans, uh, right. and then and then you can also analyze it, and that's, that's what people are doing now. By that, I mean there's so many people who are who are evaluating the performance of these chatbots, right? Yeah. How is Chat GTP doing, and where, where is it making making errors and stuff like that? And then you can see like, well, we need to improve here and here and here. And then it remains to be seen whether the methods that we have now will 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 be able to solve those problems or whether you actually need a paradigm shift, right? And new models, new models are then developed. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, through the, the failures of the abstractions, you get a window into new concrete possibilities. Right. Right, so that's I mean, that's basically that's kind of okay. So it's not uh, thesis, anti-thesis, anti -thesis, synthesis, but it's right. It's, it's abstraction, abstraction, and then the failure of the abstraction. Indeed. Yeah, and so that to me brings me and, to and like here, um, abstraction is basically so that I find interesting. So abstraction is basically something that you've you have discarded too many relationships in your in your. In your abstraction, basically, your abstraction is is leaving out relationships. That's what it is, basically. It's too simple. We know, so like that's the big thing is like like there's a big difference between humans who know their abstractions are incomplete, and people who think on some level their abstractions are good the way they are, complete the way they are, right? Whether consciously or unconsciously. Um. And the difference between those two perspectives on abstractions will change the way in which you subjectively relate to failure or the way you subjectively relate to your model requiring a, a major update, potentially. Sometimes to the point of a paradigm shift. And in terms of Friston's model, that would basically mean these, these, uh, these in internal states that need to be, that need to be updated. Yeah, and for as as I understand. yeah, and for Hegel, it would be the a priori categories. It would be like your your category system is is no longer no 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 longer fit to the environment. Let's say, but to to some extent, you that must be you have, to, you have right? to derive you have to derive new categories. But, but to some extent, so this is also something that I, 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 I was questioning, right? So, so, so we have this, we have this, we have two probability distributions, right? So we have this joint probability distribution over the, the actions, the sensory inputs, the internal states, and, uh, and the external states. This is called P. And then you have this, this, uh, this uh, variational distribution, so this approximation, which is called Q, which, which gives you the probability of the external states given the ex in internal states. And then, and then my question is, well, What's the flexibility? So we have P and Q, right? So you, if you get born as a certain organism, right, is your your P is then fixed? You know, this joint probability distribution is that something that is that is fixed? And and also your well, the, the question is to what extent is this fixed, and yeah. to what extent is it is it variable? And then the same thing with Q, right? So to what extent is this Q fixed, um, and to what extent is it is it variable? So there yeah, must be some mean, kind of some kind of a, a priori a, a priori structure to these two probability distributions. You know, like an insect doesn't have the same p and the same q as a 
as a human being. So, so you get born into this, basically. Well, that's part of what Kant's talking about with the a priori. Is right. now might people right. now, now many many people would suggest that Kant's a priori are too fixed. Right. Yeah. But that would that would be that would be one way to to criticize Kant's categories. Is that he's he's too dependent? He's not showing us how he derived those categories, and there's more variability in the potential categories that we use to, let's say, um, interpret, I, like as an interpretive structure. You know what is the and that break like what is the space of interpretive structures, and how fixed are the interpretive structures that we we inherit from the past and were born with. And how much of those, and how much are those interpretive structures dependent on the very conditions of our birth? So, like that's where I think you'd get brought to questions of the Oedipal complex or something like that. Like, how fixed is the Oedipal complex, for example? How variable is the Oedipal complex? Right. This is yeah. like this is like this is this is. Uh, you know, I remember reading Deleuze talking about we need a much more variable approach to the Oedipal, Oedipus complex. There are other people, including Lacan, who would say the Oedipal complex is sort of a universal starting point, but you can go beyond it. Like that, it's not like like it might be your uh, originary starting condition, but it's not your necessary ending condition. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's that's very interesting. So that was one of the things that that came up when I read read these articles. So where P and Q, where they, do they come from, and to what extent can they change, also during a lifetime, and what defines them, right? Um, and also, it seems to be that it's a bit related to the phenomenon and the phenomenon, right? So you have this phenomenon and noumena. Yeah. So this this uh, external um, this, this external state is basically the 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 noumenon, right? And yeah. And then you have uh, yeah. That's what I was, and that's what I was trying to introduce with the a priori category. We would say phenomena and noumena, and here, you know, someone like Kant is saying that the noumena is forever inaccessible. You can never understand the noumena in itself, and all we have access to is phenomena, and all we have is phenomenal objectivity. Right. Yeah. Right. But so of course, I, it makes. Yeah, but, yep. but, the, but the modeling system itself is part of the the whole process is part of the world itself, right? So, right, and that would be what Hegel said. Yeah, that that would be my. I mean, that, because then you create a split, right? I mean, but but well, that whole process Kant created is... Kant created the split between the phenomena and the noumena, and Hegel said we have to consider the noumena as derived from from Kant himself from phenomena that it, it doesn't exist independent of that. Yeah. But then, so in this in this in this uh, free energy model, so you have a clear difference between this this probability distribution that includes the external state. This is a joint probability distribution that includes so so uh, sensory uh, sensory states, action states, internal states, and external and external states. Right. So you have a big probability distribution over these four uh, these four random variables. Right. And then you have this 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 other distribution. So the the the, the variational distribution Q. And and that 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 is an approximation, right? So you have these two distributions, and one one has a, a certain quality of truth, right? This is the correct probability distribution, and the other one is is um, is is an approximation. Mm -hmm. So it's it's the relationship between our models and truth. Yeah, yeah, but, but then again, so where does this where does this joint distribution come from, right? So this this grand truth. How is that encoded in the organism? So is that just because you 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 kind of like let's say an insect just by being an insect to some extent models the or is that probability distribution? Well, so that that has an inherently so so that that has this probability distribution, this joint probability distribution that is so to say the ground truth, right? Yeah, it's built into us, so to speak. Um, yeah, the exa the example that I could derive from both evolutionary biology and um, Hegelian philosophy is in evolutionary biology. I remember reading these studies where they, for example, they took the uh, webbing out of a spider, but it would still go through the motions of trying to build a web. 
right sort of built into it to build a web the same thing wow. with beavers the, the same thing with beavers building a dam if you take a beaver out of its natural environment it'll still try to go through the motions of building a dam even if it doesn't have the materials or anything to build a dam with it's built into it right and it's the same thing for example with the superorganisms like bees and termites and stuff like that like it's built into them to build those structures that they build right now yeah. with 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 human with human beings hegel's idea is is that and this is the paradox of the logic is that he says the logic is sort of historically unfolding but it's also sort of like built into us in some sense like it's a it's it's like um like uh, that he uses the metaphor of the the fetus and the adult human like the like that the adult human is already in the fetus but it's not yet for itself meaning you know like thomas hamelrick as an adult identity of course was not in the embryo but the possibility of something like thomas hamelrick was in the embryo <laughs> Right. right. It just yeah. became for itself over 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 its historical like that. It became Thomas Hamelrick through the history, through the process. Yeah, but you have this. So in this the Mark of Blankets of Life article, we have this interesting figure here uh, about uh, the, you know, the, the Mark of Blankets all the way. Right. So, so you have the the, the, yeah, the symbol Mark of blankets all the way. Yeah. Like the, let's say a, a protist, you know, like unicellular animal. So that that models the world. And then you have plants. Um, so these are, are, are conglomerates of many cells so that, that remodel the world. And then you have something, so you have, proto, so they call it protozoa, plants, and then finally pontiffs. So these are blankets within blankets. And, and th there it says, like, we model ourselves modeling the world. Yeah. So it's, it's like there's, with every sort of complexification of the boundaries, there's... Um, there's a quantification which correlates to a, a new quality. Like a new quality will emerge at a certain level of complexification or a certain quantity of blankets, boundaries. And the human level would be like, I think not just Hegel, I think many philosophers would say that the human level is reflection, that we, we have models that reflect on our models. Whereas hypothetic, like I always have the spontaneous sort of ideology that my dog isn't modeling itself. Or, you know, the geese at the park are not modeling themselves. They have a model, which is a model of what it means to be a geese or what it, a model of what it means to be a beaver or whatever animal it is. But they don't have a self-referential model. So... This is a this is a quality that emerges as a consequence of the complexification or the quantification of 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 models models upon models, and at a certain point it gets so complex you need to have a model of yourself. Like whenever I watch animals, I always have the spontaneous ideology that that like it must be cognitively nice. <laughs> they, they, they just seem to be a sort of simple immediacy. Mm -hmm. And they don't have so much this problem of a self-mediation. And basically everything that I think the phenomenology of spirit is, is about this, the problem of self-mediation and the failure of objects as you self-mediate and try to figure out the truth of, of, of yourself. Like, it doesn't seem like my dog had that problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> Does this make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense, yeah. But it's kind of interesting that so there's this this grand truth, right? It's very, cons I mean, there's, there's something interesting there because then, as you said, you know, like you you take the beaver out of the water and or the spider out of the web, and then it, it's it still goes through the motion. So in that sense, so so it it went from a from a grand truth to something that that is is not a grand truth at all anymore, right? It's, it's, well, it seems the, that the truth becomes as well. Like the truth yeah, is but also you're, you're stuck in you're basically stuck in your so in in some sense it's kind of like well you you it's as if you kind of start deconnecting from the from the world because you you have because you're you're because the the, the distribution that you use as, that you use as a grand truth is not is not connected anymore to 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 the bigger the bigger picture so to say right um 
So, so, so my... you're born with this, so you have P and Q, right? Q approximate P. And normally, if you're kind of, let, let's say, an insect, you know, uh, flying around or, or a spider doing its thing and, and catching flies, you know, there's some kind of, so this 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 P is, is in a sense, part of the world. But if you don't do all kinds of weird things to the spider, you know, like you do genetic manipulation, so it cannot cannot make any spider silk anymore or something like that, then 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 there's this distribution is not is not adequate anymore to model the 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 outside world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, the way in which the Hegelian philosophy makes sense of this is substance to subject. So. I think substance would be close to, to P and subject would be a result of the unfolding of Q, I suppose. Not, not, not sure if it, how well these languages map, but the point is, is that, or you were saying ground truth versus an unfolding truth. And so you start like, in some sense, the dialectical story is the story of a repeating process of substance becoming subject. So again, like an embryo becoming Thomas Hamelrick, but an embryo also became Cadell Last, right? Substance become subject, and that happens recursively, meaning every human that ever existed unfolded from substance to subject, and in a way in which the truth that they embodied in their later years was not the truth that they started with, it was an unfolding of that truth. Right. Well, well, and, even and they were in a loop yeah. with that, a feedback loop with that. Yeah. Well, even the, the ground truth, so to say, this P will will change with with age and 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 you know your body also changes and things like that, right? So, um, so but that that's um, I'm just trying to map, trying to get get a discourse between the languages, seeing. Insofar as the map works, insofar as the map fails, insofar as the the language game makes sense or not. Well, it, it seems to be that so if you then talk about like what 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 is so 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 consciousness seems to be associated with this this gap. It's this yes. gap between your approximation and the and the and the, and that's the, why the, we the, need the, consciousness. Yeah. We need consciousness because the abstractions fail. And that's why people want the perfect model so they can stop because they don't they actually don't know they don't want to be conscious. That's why people like going to sleep. And why you don't want to wake up in the morning, why some people struggle to get out of bed in the morning. Right? right. Like they struggle to find the motivation to 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 face the day. <laughs> to be conscious. Right? Because the their conscious is a function of something failing and like what do we do? Like, even like, for example, at the end of Thus Spoke Zarathustra, he said, what matters my suffering or my happiness? I have my work, he says. So what do we do? We work. Like, what is Marxism about? It's about work. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, mm -hmm. your work as a human. So why do we have to work? Because, like, we're working on something because it's not perfect, because it's something wrong. Like, why are you hired as a professor of X, Y, or Z field to... <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Something's not working. Why does someone pay you to do something? Yeah, so the, the, the next thing, you know, what I would suppose that I had like, you know, you, you want to model humans in, in a bit more detail with this, with this model, right? So then, then uh, I would put in drives, you know, Panksep, the seven drives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, care and, and lust and, 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 and play and stuff like that. And then the mimetic desire of of, uh, of Girard, right? And you have the level of desire, which is the Girardian level, and then the, the drive level, which is which is banks up, right? And then you would basically kind of come up with some kind of variational model, and and the matching AI to to uh, um, to implement that all, and then pick something that you want to simulate, right? Or predict or something like that. I mean, the easiest thing to do would probably be the, the stock exchange, right? I mean, it's a large number of people that are driven by mimetic desire. And then, then there's, of, of course, also a great incentive to, to, to do something with that, right? And you can test it. Does it work or not? And to what extent has that been done? To what extent do you think that represents something new? I, I don't think, I don't think, that's, I don't think people have, have, have done anything with Girard computationally. 
Yeah. So what do you, so outside of the stock market, what else do you think might be uh, a target of uh, research? Well, you can, well, you can, you can model social unrest and things like that, right? Uh, conflict and mm -hmm. um, you can kind of, you can do all kinds of, of uh, yeah. I think it's, it's you, you, you have to be concrete and have some, some kind of measurements and then also some ways so you need to kind of be able to test your models, right? So um, that's the so the best way to, to kind of really develop something like that is to pick a real a practical problem that forces you to to have good results, and and people should be interested in the results because then it becomes very concrete, right? Because if you make the theoretical problems and it's all oh, look we we run this simulation and we saw this behavior, so it's it's nice to have an incentive. Mm. Okay, so I think we should talk a little bit more about artificial intelligence before we before we close up the conversation. So just in regards to modern society, the human individual, let's say artificial intelligence exploding in terms of its use function. Um, one of my hypotheses would be something along the lines of if a lot of our traditional use function, our traditional work um, evaporates basically because of artificial intelligence, then, you know, the traditional narrative is this concern that the machines just replace us. But another possibility is that it opens up new spaces to explore the mystery of truth and existence that just wasn't open to us before. Like, so like one of my favorite examples would be if you told people in the 19th century, the percentage of people in the 21st century that are doing farming work they would say, well, what do we do? Like, we're, we're all farmers, right? So, so I think a lot of people have this concern today is like, like, for example, like, I mean, take, for example, like three big time traditional professions in the 20th century, where if you did those professions, you'd probably be good for life. Like, and this is, I'm talking about like middle-class professions, like lawyer, doctor, professor, right? Like, those were like some of the things I was considering as a university kid was like, do I become a professor? Do I become a doctor? Do I, you know, what, where, where do I put my energy so that I could potentially get a, well, that was one of the considerations running through my head. Hmm. Increasingly, those things are evaporating. And I do think that artificial intelligence will play a role in at least reducing the need for some of these professions, at least on the scale that they were um, available in the 20th century. What do you what do you make of this relationship, and and how do you think these theories uh, inform your understanding of this horizon? Let's say. Yeah, well, the, 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 it's often said that you know there will be no more no more jobs for humans, and but it, that doesn't seem to be that doesn't really seem to be uh, what we are seeing, right? Um, so it seems that just if you have machines. Uh, that can do something complicated and you have humans who use these machines and they do something even more complicated mm -hmm. um, based on, on what the machines do so 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 we're still in a in a situation where where um, it's more machines will help humans than than machines take over completely now but it's not entirely clear to me whether this situation will remain like this um, it's certainly possible yeah. that in the near future that we automate things like um, you know, uh, shopping, uh, um, yeah, uh, warehouses, um, um, transport, for example, truck driving. I mean, that, that there is a high chance that that will disappear, right? Um, mm. So it's not clear to me whether this will remain like this. Yeah, it seems like a runaway feedback loop or a bootstrapping process where it's it's kind of like an arms race. You know, like I think about like, I mean, take, for example, you and me, I, I always like to just bring it back to like, you know, what's actually going on here? <laughs> mm. Like, if you take you and me, I mean, I'm 36, you're in you're whatever, you're a decade, two decades, you're a, a generation older than me. Yeah, you're, 51. Working, you're 51. So you're working in a university, and I'm kind of building an online study, <laughs> study space. So I feel like in some sense, you see in that gap, like, the arms race that's going on between the generations in some sense, because, and then the question for someone like me is the technology allows me to do something more complex, namely set up some sort of online school. 
which I wouldn't have been able to do if I had been born 20 years earlier. Right, yeah. Then the question is, how long do, do, do how long does this uh, setup last that my function is still necessary and that that could just be automated? And then if that's automated, then 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 basically that would be that would mean that there's a concrete failure in my abstractions and I need to change tactic, like meaning what what would be my you know is there again in this in this feedback is there another yet even more complex uh, function <laughs> that I could uh, uh, situate myself, for example? Yeah, well. Well, one of the things that will be difficult to automate is just being with other humans, right? Care and play and things like that. That, that will be very difficult to automate. Um, although there's not that much money maybe in there. I mean, I don't know. Um, it will be very interesting to see what, what, what kind of jobs uh, remain in 10 or 15 years, right? I mean, also now everybody at the university, we're all having... So I'm, I work at the university. I, I teach I teach uh, four courses a year, right? So now we, we are running our exams through through chat GTP, right? Because this thing can, can answer our exams now, right? So if we, if you crazy. ask our students, you know, write a... Typically, you don't... You don't so you typically, you don't so ask very students, complicated the students questions, use right? the, uh, the students use the AI to write their articles, and then you use the AI to mark the articles, and then you, we don't need students or teachers. Yeah, then we can, <laughs> we, 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 uh, we, we can all just pretend, you know. Then the, but, uh, I mean, but it's, it's a paradox because we want, we want to test these, these people, right? Do, do, they know, do they know stuff? But, then, then we, but our, many of our exams cannot be solved with AI, and we're just at the start of it, right? It's just this year that it came out. This thing, so I wrote 20 years ago, I wrote something called BioPDB. This is software that can be used for, for protein structures. So if you want to, if you work with protein structures and, and you want to do data harvesting, so this is a standard software. It's still, the, 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 it's the standard software to do that, right? This thing knows my program. So I can ask it like, hey, chat GTP, um, write a, 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 a short program that finds errors in protein structures using three different methods. It just did that. It just generated correct code and, and it was doing something that was reasonable. But these are kind of the questions that we ask our students, right? So 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 now so so this is and this is just the start of it. I mean it's gonna be copied and improved and, and it, it it's very clear that of course I asked the uh, chat GTP and summarized the, the research of Thomas Hamelrug <laughs> yes. and the damn thing didn't know who I was. I was very, very insulted. But okay, but <laughs> The more interesting thing is that this thing has not read, uh, it has not uh, parsed Medline, read, right? It doesn't hasn't it hasn't digested the, the corpus of scientific uh, of scientific articles. I think that Facebook had a had a had a method that that actually did that, but they took it online because because it, you know people were you know there were errors in it, and people get very very upset now because it sometimes gives wrong results and stuff like that. But anyway, so but but it's very clear that we're just at the start, right? I mean, it hasn't read all the novels yet. It will do that. It hasn't read all yeah. the scientific publications yet. It will do that. So we will soon have, have these. I, mean, I had conversations with this thing about philosophy and it gave me, I got new ideas from it. So so now in the in the university, we, we can do two things. We can tell people like, don't use chat GTP, but then it means that, uh, that that's we are putting, prohibition. Yeah, that's prohibition. But then it means that we're creating artificial situations and and, and we are evaluating them in ways, that in, in situations that will dis be different from the situations that the students will be in after university. This is not good, right? So we need to kind well, of find a way. We don't want that. In my, in my, my whole PhD thesis, Global Brain Singularity, is built around the idea of, well, the Global Brain Singularity, but it, specifically the concept metasystem transition. And the metasystem transition is going to be a qualitative transition in the nature of all of our institutions like so like and this like what you just said is an example of that where what the institutions used to do uh and and you know were fit to the environment for the 20th century is no longer fit to the environment at all and right. so if you and if, so if you continue on with the same patterns well it's you're just creating an artificial situation which has no 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 practical relevance anymore yep. and you're just going to be out competed by something which is updating to the times like yes, and so, here's an interesting yeah. here's an interesting thing like for my 2022 was that 
you know, in some sense in building philosophy portal, we did a little anthology uh, and did uh, articles and, and you're participating in the, in the Nietzsche anthology. But I feel like these are not necessarily like a, like a university essay, <laughs> like where you just, uh, you know, you're just right. doing something for the marks in the class. It's more something like you're participating in something because you really want to make sense of, you know, yourself and you want to make a contribution to the philosophical literature yourself. And it's not like you're trying to impress the professor. Or I'm not grading you or anything like that. So it's a little something different. And I think that we need to do experiments like this. You know, academics need to do experiments like this, where we we innovate with how we do academics. Like, and here, like, let me just say one thing and I'll let, get your feedback on this is like, I met a few really smart professors who were tenure track professors who said, if I didn't become a tenure track professor, I wouldn't have known what to do with my life. And then when I think about what, you know, and I'm sort of in that position is like, what do I do with my life? Because I don't sure I'd be a tenure track professor or something like that. Then I think about, well, what is a professor doing? Well, a professor is teaching and researching and they really want to do their research because that's where their funding goes. They don't want to do the teaching so much because it's taking away from the research. How can we innovate with these? What does a professor do? You know, I, I'm constantly going on with that in my head is like, well, I can build philosophy portal. I can teach courses. Uh, you know, how, how, what would research look like? Uh, um, you know, what other sort of functions, you know, are open to someone with a sort of skill set like uh, many academics have? These are, in any case, uh, maybe let's just get your sort of final thoughts on, on, on this conversation. Like we, you know, I think the conversation. I want to follow up on, on what you said. I mean, you're, sure. you're, you're right. Somebody it's a very, but I mean, there's there's another there's another issue there. Like, you know, if you think about it, academics are not they aren't trying to solve problems. The system is not incentivized. It, it doesn't give you incentive to actually solve problems. It gives you an incentive to make a career in the university and to publish papers. This is these are two different things, right? I mean, well, people like, will tell you, people will tell you, and probably consciously they believe that they are trying to solve a problem. But solving a problem in some sense also means stopping working on that problem. Right? So so academics will have a tendency to to kind of to, to kind of to kind of um, gravitate to what Girard called model obstacles. That is, these are things that will never be solved, but they're just endless endless devices to produce articles so and that's a lot of academia academia is just just like these you know people kind of public publishing articles about a model obstacle it's kind of some kind of problem that isn't really well defined and and it's just like you know here's another little brick that i add to the wall and that will lead to the situation right and so mm. so that paradigm has not been has not been broken to an enormous extent by by alpha fold. So i know this very well because it's a, so I, I do something called structural bioinformatics it's the bioinformatics of proteins and and so the one of the big problems in in that field so the prediction of protein structure was was, was solved by a company by by uh, by deep mind which is a subsidiary of, of google and and that was just a, a, a focused team that that really wanted to produce a, a solution and and it only took them a couple of years to kind of blow the whole the whole of academia out of the water right and they are now now academia is producing articles studying the deep mind artifact so they're studying the program that was made by deep mind to see its limitations applying it in new concepts and stuff like that so this is a this is a very interesting situation right so so if you want to solve a problem right you know put a, put a lot of money in it, have a dedicated team of people who only work on it in an, in an industrial environment, right? So you only work on that. You, you, in, in this case, it was an AI-driven solution, but I mean, I think that, that that will that will apply to many many problems. And you have a, you have a solution in a couple of years, right? And yes, yes, I know it's building on years and years of academic research and stuff like that. But still, I mean, if you want to solve a problem, right? Let's say, let's say uh, multi-resistant tuberculosis, malaria, a specific type of cancer. How long will it take until people have figured out that the most efficient way to do it is to say assemble a team of 50 people, give them an give them a very high salary, no teaching, 
uh, no administration. They just work and work and work, and they, they, they don't need to publish until they solve that problem. If you have a financial system, a financial mechanism that kind of makes this viable, right? There is no need anymore for, for or it's very, there is much less need anymore for, for, for traditional science, which is, is basically producing an enormous amount of articles that nobody reads and it's working on problems that nobody is interested. So that well, that's is definitely that is, true. That is a very interesting development. And I kind of, it's very interesting now to be in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a university and seeing all that stuff collapsing, right? It's also more and more difficult to hire people. You know, yeah. I mean, good luck with hiring a, a, an, an experienced machine learning uh, person, right? I mean, <laughs> they're in high demand. I mean, if you you know you really know 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 a lot of, of machine learning, it's difficult to get them at the university now. In not not in all positions, but <clears throat> but it's it's not so it's not so easy anymore. And so I think that that we will get run into more and more problems. So what I'm I'm doing is I'm I'm kind of like I mean I'm I'm, I'm lucky that I work in a in a in a very very relevant topic machine learning and I have plenty of opportunities to do things. And what I do is I I try to kind of collaborate with companies um, to a great extent um, because it it forces you to 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 um, to, to be uh, problem oriented. And to really do, yeah, develop things that that can be that can be used in, in in real life applications. I think that's one of the things that will happen. We will have a much more closer collaboration between universities and and and, and industry, much closer than we have now. I think we will have a lot of, of uh, institutions that will be focused on one problem, and they will be they will kind of in be in between industry and and and, and academic institutions. Um, you know, CERN is a good model, I think. I think we will have to see a lot of, of, of science that will, will be like CERN, right? Very international, one spot where, where, where with a lot of specialized machinery, where a lot of, of uh, specialized people come together that work on one problem. I think that is that is probably the future of, uh, of research. Universities, I'm afraid, will, will, will might degenerate to, um, to kind of, um, you know, institutions where you just basically give people a certain... Um, basic knowledge very quickly, right? So you can also see that the length of education is is being reduced. You know that they're you know in, instead of three, three years, it's two years from two year to one year. So it's again more and more like you know you go through the university just basically like a path of very basic knowledge that you get there. Uh, also from probably get it from people who are not really that that connected to science anymore, but are who know how to teach. And, and I think we will have a dichotomy between teaching. and. and, and it sounds and, like you're describing a split between teaching and research. Yeah, because it's on. Like you it's, saw that in the I mean, I saw that in the professor's lives when I was a student yeah. was that, that it's professors not, it's didn't, they didn't want to valid. teach. They just wanted to do research. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also it's like you have no incentive to, to teach. Right? You, you, you do your best for teaching because it's not it's I mean, these are young people and you want to help them. Right. I mean, that's why. I mean, I hate being badly prepared for teaching, so I really put a lot of effort in it. But you really not, you, there's no incentive to do good teaching, basically. Yeah, exactly. Very yeah. little incentive. I mean, people go through the motions and there's all this talk about it and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it's about funding and about publications. And and so I think that these systems that 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 do not incentivize people in the right way and that have a... a um, a dichotomy between 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 you know this is what we expect of you and this is how we reward you these systems will increasingly fall apart but of course it's the question is right yeah how do you create systems like that that where, where these things are aligned right but again the, this yeah. whole publication publication ideas is uh there is a yeah so so i think that alpha fold has shown that 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 you you need other incentives than than just publication well, to me, in, in the way I'm spontaneously making sense of what you're talking about, it, it seems to represent the split between the phenomenology and the logic, where the phenomenology would be more the teaching, you know, like teaching, you know, helping the coming to be of spirit, the, the young kids coming up as they learn about uh, various general fields of, pardon me, general fields of knowledge, and then the logic would just be the hardcore research <laughs> like so solve a problem and when you figured it out write a clear paper about it 
Yeah, so yeah. Like this split between phenomenology and logic is uh, is interesting to think. Yeah, I think that Peter Thiel once said it. You know, like um, you know, you should kind of make people pay people to do one thing well. And and especially university is just a is just an in incredible. These are incredible spaces where people are. You need to do a lot of things, a lot of things. Well, teaching, research, getting funding. Oh yeah, people are overburdened. Yeah, but I'm, I mean, it's it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's like you need to be you need incredibly multifaceted um, because there's so many different uh, different tasks that you need to excel at. Uh, yeah. Well, let me tell you where where this conversation led for me is like we started off with sort of like a, a sort of a basic introduction to one of the foundational universal theories of the brain. And then we work through that as best as we could with some interaction with philosophy to um, our modern technological situation, which is being made by, by an artificial intelligence based on basically better and better understandings of, of how intelligence works, you know, and, and that feedback that, that feeds back on our day-to-day -day life that feeds back on how we think about becoming adults and how we think about, you know, ethically acting in the world, building our careers. What do we want to pay attention to? What are we interested in? How do we collaborate with others? And how do we build a shared world and all of these questions? So to me, that's a good example. This conversation taking as a whole, taken as a whole, you take this conversation as a whole, you start off with a very concrete scientific principle. You try to work out that principle and see its consequences, see its results and then try to sense make what it means for subjectivity and, and for the shared human world for world spirit or something like that. Um, and I think that's the type of thinking, that's the type of conversations that I would like to open with the science of logic. And I hope that, you know, someone like you, your course is going to open up some of these questions. And I think, you know, anyway, so that's a, that's a teaser at that. So thank you for coming on. Um, I guess the final question I would have, have for you is, is where do you see this, this work going for you on the one hand you've got the machine learning your 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 professorships and collaborations with corporations on the other hand you're always very interested in metaphysics you're always very interested in philosoph philosophical topics how do you see where you are and well i'm i i think actually so uh, so i i would like to thank you for kind of uh, you know like challenging me a bit and and, uh, and take, being part of this uh um, the science of logic uh, course because uh, so I'm I'm basically now now finding out that the, uh, this is very interesting stuff this this uh, this this whole uh, active learning um, paradigm and and I have the mathematical background to understand it and um, what what I would like to do is is um, is basically exploring probabilistic machine learning and the applications to it. Um, that is to to that is not well. I can basically it's 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 a it's a, a language that allows you to think about a wide range of topics. So you can think about bioinformatics, you know, problems in molecular biology, protein structure, and stuff like that. But now you can I can also read these articles that describe on how how uh, living systems work and and how uh, how uh, how brains function. Um, and so that that's, that that actually shows that these types of that this this kind of language is this language of, of probabilistic models of probabilistic machine learning is is extremely powerful, and I think that that basically linking that up to practical to problems that are concrete, you know, problems in for example how do you how do you uh, construct an AI that um, that does a certain specific task like you know a certain chat uh, robot or or how do you solve a concrete problem like a certain type of cancer. I think that linking these two together, so you have like a kind of a universal method like probabilistic machine learning, and then making it very concrete by by linking it up to, to concrete problems. I mean that that's I think where where I'm I'm uh, I'm going. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll be and interested some, to see. Yep. And Gerard. And Gerard, of course. Yeah, yeah we can't <laughs> leave out Gerard. Got to yeah. throw him in right at the end there. Well, thanks for coming on, Thomas. I'm going to be excited to see how that unfolds, and I definitely. Uh, I'm excited to see how your um, how your uh, your aspect of the course fits within the the larger scheme. I know it will will offer a lot, and I think this conversation, like the others I had with Layman and Daniel, are sort of windows into the types of questions and the types of ways of thinking we're hoping to cultivate and and explore. And 
and a very open, very speculative type of way. So thanks for coming on. And this was Brain Sciences and Artificial Intelligence with Thomas Hamilton.